Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Glory and honor and praise to our God. I thank God for, uh, as Mother Bauer said, this great service thus far, and certainly she is in that line and lineage of great service with all of those wonderful songs that um, I don't know about some of you all, but those are what I thought were the songs growing up. That's what church was. That's what freedom was. That's what all of it was about. And, you know, songs are an expression of what we believe, right? So we believe that freedom is coming. We believe that God has made a way. We believe all the things that uh, come through that melody that we make in our heart as a reminder. And even in sometimes when folk were not allowed to read and write, they missed something because they allowed them same folks that were under oppression to sing. And I tell you what, when they could sing, they didn't need reading and writing because you would remember the text if you heard it in a song, isn't that right? We knew that God was gonna trouble the water because if you didn't let me read a Bible or write a verse, somebody sung it and the next generation grabbed hold of it and told the children, come on. <laughs> God gonna trouble the water. And later on when we found out that God troubling the water was a time of healing and deliverance, then we understood what we had already been singing about. Isn't that right? Mother Bowers, thank you for all of that. God bless you, giving honor to God, to his son Jesus, to the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, our keeper and our sealer, that we seal up the promise in the Holy Ghost. So we thank God for the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost on today. Thank God for all of you in your respective places. Double and triple honor to Mother Bowers. She's great in so many ways and a testimony that God is yet working miracles. You know, the enemy wants us to think that everything is bad. These are tough times. These are difficult days. This is the tribulation. Well, no, this is a day that the Lord have made. And when folks said years ago, Mother Bowers wouldn't be able to talk hardly, let alone sing, she's singing with a depth and an anointing that is even greater because the, the you know, trying of our faith work with patience and tribulation gives that anointing. And so we thank God for not the suffering that we do, but the result of it. We wear a crown of glory because we suffer with him. We reign with him. And that reign uh, gets misinterpreted that some folk think we ain't going to reign till we get to glory. No, you're going to reign upon the earth. You have authority right now because of what God already did and what you have already suffered. So we thank God for our mother Bowers going forth mightily. And each of you that gave these great testimonies, our elder Tony Bowers with the uh, conducting of the service all the way, the songs and everything that's gone before. Double honor to all of you on today, the leaders and those that are just making a great service better. Amen. We do thank God for Independence Day and the 4th of July or whatever you say, as Mother Bauer said, independence says it all. We can sum it up. We're independent from different things. Sometimes we're saying it for the same reason. Sometimes we're saying it for others but it is that liberty. And I think Elder Tony or somebody said earlier where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You can be free even in a place of bondage. You can be blessed in a place of scarcity because God has given us the freedom to not be like other folks, <laughs> isn't that right? He's given us the ability to sing a different song and walk a different path. Even when the path we're on looks bleak and sorrow, God will give us a walk of joy and faith. So we're glad about it. And we thank God for each and every one of you to Pastor Sid um, and Mother Lily and to all of the elders and ministers and each of you that hold a place of responsibility and authority in the Lord. Thank you for doing that and carrying forth the Lord's work so that the Lord's church, which he said the gates of hell would not prevail against, the Lord's church can carry on. The enemy so desires to break the assembly. You know, he doesn't want us to obey that one command assemble yourselves together in a congregation. He wants to break the congregation, congregation, whether through pandemic or getting us so used to not seeing one another. But we know that God saves the remnant so he can produce uh, a magnificent army out of that remnant. Every time I read the Bible where God preserved folks through a great situation, they came out on the other side and flourished and prospered and grew. And God is consistent in all that he does. What the enemy means for bad, God will turn it around and use it for our good. So we thank God for that. Thank God for each of you. We're gonna to go to the 11th chapter of Hebrews today and share a little scripture with you. I am cognizant that it is a holiday um, and that there is celebration and things going on. People aren't at home and they're listening from various places. So it is my desire to be uh, brief. Well, I don't know how we define brief, but briefer than not. <laughs> and I don't have the scripture printed out, but if you go to the 11th chapter of Hebrews, we're going to start at the beginning and then 
flip over to the fourth chapter of Romans uh, as well. And I just want to talk a little bit about faith. We live by faith. We walk by faith. We live and move and have our being in Jesus Christ by faith. And yet I am aware, hallelujah, let me pause for a minute. Father, we thank you right now, hallelujah. We thank you for your word and for all that you have done, for all that you are, done, are, are all that you are, God. Let your word be real to us. Bring it alive in our hearts. Let it be rhema and revelation. Let it be logos and living, oh God. Let it be powerful and anointed. Let it accomplish your very purpose as the dew and the rain that comes from heaven does not return unto you void, accomplishing that that you sent it forth to do. Let your preached word be such today that those that hear would have ears to hear and understand and eyes to perceive and see, oh God, we thank you right now in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost, have your way now. We are here, and God, we thank you today. Let your anointing speak for us today in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. We thank God because we can look at faith a lot of ways, and I just want to uh, talk today about some of the ways that faith is a blessing to us. You can't have salvation without faith. Amen. No matter what you do, how good you are, you can't have salvation without faith. You cannot hear except God sends a preacher and they can't preach except they be sent. You can't hear without them. So we can't have salvation without believing and we have to believe in the right thing. You know, you have faith, but if you don't have it in the right thing, it's not going to accomplish the purpose that God sent it forth to do. And, you know, somebody said, well, I don't have any faith. Well, if you've ever been on an airplane, you have faith. You have faith in the aerodynamics and the science and the lift and the drag and all those things that you don't understand and when you trust something that you don't understand, that's faith. So we have faith. We have faith to get in an automobile and we are not auto mechanics, but we trust them. And I do thank God and pause for uh, just a moment to thank God for the testimony of uh, Sister Yvonne and all that <clears throat> had happened and thanking God that even when the accidents happen, somebody can drive home and say, I wanna be where mommy is just in case something happens that's faith. You make a car go where it should not go to get where your spirit tells you you need to be when there is trouble. That's part of that raising children in the way that they should go. When difficulty comes, they don't depart. They run and get nigh and close. We thank God for that. Thank God for our elder Tony and for all that uh, he does. I see that the word of God has now come up on the screen. You all gave some great testimonies and, and songs today. And I was listening to uh, Mother Goldsberry. I'm looking for a miracle. And all of the things that came throughout this service have been wonderful, and I'm glad about it. And I'm going to try and be expeditious, but I am excited. The anointing of the Lord is here. Somebody say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hey, you know, when y'all in service, I can look at you and see whether you're with me or not. Now I have to hear <laughs> every now and then. So uh, I see the chats pop up, but I'm a little far away to read them. But we do thank God. One of the things that Elder Tony said in his testimony, talking about when he had gone to the uh, epidome of communist thinking and entrenched communist living in China, um, is that they viewed the church interestingly. Um, and he said, yeah, it was a little dry and it was ecumenical, one service for all faiths. And yet I look at that and go, you know, sometime I wonder if the unbeliever sees the church better than we think we that are in it think we are supposed to see it because there is really one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church. The problem is those of us in the church like to divide ourselves, separate ourselves, re-identify ourselves, and then go off to congregations that only include ourselves. And sometimes, certainly not, not endorsing uh, that over there. I am glad that he was able to get in church in a faraway land. Uh, but sometimes we have to step back and remember that the Lord is the Lord of the church. I studied uh, denominations as part of some of the theological studying that I did. And I had a course um, uh, at Concordia University that was on denominations. And at that time, 20 years ago, um, there were 1,300 denominations. And all I could conclude is that somebody has created dogma that Jesus did not create. Somebody has created churches that may not be the ones that the Lord had. Now I'm clearly aware of the admonition that Jesus gave the disciples that those that weren't against him are for him. So I'm certainly not going out trying to 
look at everybody's church apologetically and say you ought to believe this or that, but I am aware that the body of Christ is in a time now where we're going to need our unity to such a degree that we ought not let our differences divide us so dramatically. Now, there are some that say they are apostles and are not, but do lie. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the real folks that are really saved that yet are divided. And the adversary knows that a house divided has less strength than a house that is united. It doesn't take a whole lot. Unfortunately, when I was looking at the film of that building that collapsed in Florida and all of the other buildings that collapsed and, and in my job, the uh, building inspection department reports to me. So I have the chief building inspector that reports to me and he talks about buildings that collapsed. We had one down in the city where I work, uh, the top of a building fell off. Buildings do fall and they don't fall because the entire structure fails. They fall because a key component fails. And so in the church, the building that is fitly joined together by God, the adversary doesn't need to get the whole church weak. He needs to get a component of the church weak. So he starts to look and see who he can devour in order to bring down the whole church. He just has to knock down key pieces. And if you're one of those key pieces, then you ought to know that the adversary has come at you with everything he had, because if he can get you to fall and stumble, maybe there's a domino effect that all of those for whom you have been influential will stumble also. And so with that in mind, we do need to look at ourselves as one body because we don't wanna inadvertently become a tool of the adversary that identifies weaknesses in other parts of the body only to give rise to the devil going after those parts that we identify as weak. We ought to pray for them, strengthen them, lift them up, build them up so that even if they're weak, we become their armor. Is that all right? Somebody wave your hand or say glory in the chat. Hallelujah. Thank God we are one body and we are there. And so Elder Tony's testimony led me into some of what I want to talk about today quickly as I can. Uh, and that's the unity of the faith, getting into faith and doing what God sent faith here to do. And God did not send faith here for it to simply be a grabbing tool. You know, they make these tools, they got a handle on them. You can grab stuff off the top shelf with them and get a jar or a can and put it up in the cabinet. It is a grabbing tool. And sometimes we get confused and we become uh, convinced that God put faith here only as a tool to grab the stuff that we want. I'm not sure that God would have bothered if that was the reason of faith. Faith is not your tool to grab what you want. And if I go into Hebrews 11 and one without first messing with your um, hermeneutics a little bit, the, the messing with your understanding and interpretation of the grace covenant a little bit, you're going to hear me say different things when I start by saying now faith. So I need to do a little background work to make sure that when I'm saying faith, I'm talking about faith that is at the core of your salvation, faith that is the mechanism whereby God makes the promise of Abraham sure to all the seed. God uses faith to make sure that all the seed gets the promise. And that's a hard thing to do there. And it, it depends not only on your, what you believe and interpret, it depends on your exegesis, how you explain what you believe. And so to explain it properly, I wanna make sure we're all thinking about the same faith. Cause I have taught and will teach that you can get anything by faith, anything that you need from God, you can receive it by faith. But the principal thing that you need to receive by faith, and I think the unity of the faith rests in this idea that we live because we have faith. And if we live because we have faith, then it behooves us to find out from whence cometh faith, because when I want life, I need to get more faith. And if I need faith, I need to find out where it came from. And to cut to the chase, God gave everyone a measure of faith. He didn't only give you life in abundance, he gave you a measure of the ability to reason and find out whether these things are so or not. Preaching that is not mixed with faith is ineffectual. So depending upon, amen, depending upon what you believe, you will find out that folks can get preached to and it's not effectual in them because they don't have that faith mechanism 
ready to receive the things that you are saying. Is somebody there can say amen? Amen. 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 So when we talk about faith, and I will in a minute, I've got Hebrews 11 right in front of me. When we talk about faith, let's suspend our thought of I'm going to get my stuff by faith to I'm going to live this life by faith. And then when you live this life and seek God by faith, all the stuff gets added to you. There is a promise of God that when we seek God and his kingdom, joy, peace, righteousness in the Holy Ghost, we seek his kingdom by faith, then all of this stuff that the Gentiles seek shall be added. But if you seek the stuff, then God hedges up your way so you can't receive the blessings of the kingdom. Uh, it is a... a a tricky thing that if you seek stuff, you usually don't get stuff. If you seek God, you get God, and then God adds stuff to you as is appropriate. Amen? And so faith does cause things to abound, but it abounds because what we have accepted about God and the premise that we understand about God, and then we stand on that premise, which is a, what allows us to defy circumstances. Somebody said, uh, in testimony that this is the church that we prayed for, that we believe for. And I would say even farther than that, we defied circumstance to be where we are right now. I don't testify a lot, but I will tell you this. We have a testimony that during the midst of the Great Recession, I recall that General Motors had gone bankrupt. The government had to come in and save one of the largest companies in the history of the world Nobody could get credit. General Motors couldn't get credit from a bank anywhere to save their company. And Vessels of Honor got financed to not only finance our church, but some may have forgotten, we financed and helped finance the church for the person that bought our church. We raised funds and did it for us and then raised funds and made sure that they were able to secure the building that they were, and we did it all by faith. Wave at me if you remember or if you believe that. Hallelujah. Amen. So God has shown us that faith is the way to get those things, but the buildings didn't have faith. The people had to have faith because we knew who God was and what God had said and what God had promised. We defied circumstances. Circumstances told us it's not possible. You can't do it. The experts in the world were saying the economy has collapsed. Nothing is going to happen. Nobody's going to be blessed. Stand by. We'll tell you when things get better. We'll let you know when the government has fixed it. Well, the government hadn't fixed it yet. And yet God said, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so by faith, we as a little flock stood on what God said and God proved himself true. Now faith is. You are in situations right now where your normal toolbox isn't working. What you had and worked before and what did before and the things you had have been disrupted. They are not working, they are not available. But your God has not quit, he is still available, he is still working, he's still gonna bring you through. The evidence that you are still with God is that you won't give up on what God promised because circumstances have come that will make you feel like or make it look like the promise of God is not sure, that the promise of God is not steadfast, that his yeas are not yea and his amens are not amen, but I tell you that they are. Um, the pandemic may have separated us physically for a time, but I can tell you that God has not said to me, and I don't believe he said to you, that we won't return to the sanctuary in mass again. I believe we will come back on large order to this place that God told us to be. He did not say, give up the hallowed ground and let it go. Yeah, we may have been out for a while. God has preserved this place, so we have something to come back to. You know, when the enemy disrupts your life, he wants you to give up your faith so that you don't believe what you once had is now attainable for you. The reason he wants you to fall away from God is so he can ultimately get you to wonder if you were ever in God. If he can get you to doubt that you are who you are in God right now, that the righteousness of Christ is on you now, he will then try and make you forget about God and nullify your faith wholly. So faith causes us to live the life that God would have us to live. And when we live the life that God would have us to live, then we produce the fruit that God said 
we would produce. When we live the life that God calls us to live, we will produce the fruit that God has declared we will produce. And so when we have a deficiency, don't go after the deficient thing, go after the deficiency of faith, cure that thing by faith, and that deficient item will manifest itself again. You may have thought that it was your stock account that was sustaining you, and then the stock market crashed and that account was gone, but if you have stayed in the faith and secured in God, that thing will manifest even if somebody has to knock on your door and do it. Faith is of the things that the, uh, is evidence of things that we have hoped for, and it is the substance of the things that we now see. Um, so we thank God for that. I guess I'm at my first verse there. So let me read it <laughs> after all of that. Are y'all still with me? Amen. 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 Now faith is, right? So there's a time factor. It's talking about the difference between faith under the Older Testament and faith in the current Testament, the New Testament. And when we talk about now faith is, we are in a covenant relationship with God under a new Testament. We have a new way of hermeneutically understanding God because we see the factors of the old and they are our in sample so that we can understand how God dealt with faith in the old and we can live it out exegetically in the new. We can express that faith of the Old Testament in the New Testament and the common element is faith. I'll start it off with Tony's testimony and the common element that I hope was in all of the people attending those services, even though their method of worship was restricted and defined by the government or whoever was doing it, they told them, this is, go to this service, no choice. I hope that their faith was not constrained and refined because the expression of our worship isn't the determination of our faith. We have a covenant with God and our faith is not in whether I speak with tongues more than you all, as Paul said, my expression of God is in there is one faith, one Lord, one baptism, that there is one God, Father of all, and one Christ, Jesus, and one Holy Spirit. We know that we have faith in the fundamental Christian beliefs. Therefore, when the things that can be are shaken, and the things that can be are shaken right now. The Bible said it would happen in the last day. The things that we thought were unshakable are shook up right now. Across the globe, the foundations of our economy are shaken. Our standard of belief is shaken. The faith in church itself is shaken, but the faith in Jesus Christ is steadfast and immovable. Amen? So when we talk about that, just remember that it's saying now in this current covenant agreement that we're in, and we have a covenant of grace. It's a better covenant because it's a covenant of grace administered by faith. So when we think about the covenant of grace, it is unmerited favor from God. Wave your hand if you hear me. We have a covenant of grace. We have a covenant of unmerited favor from God that is delivered to us by the mechanism of faith. So this is why the enemy wants to destroy, nullify, weaken, or bring down your faith because he can't get at the covenant. God made a covenant with us, with humanity, and it is a covenant of grace that allows all manner of folks in. God made a covenant that said, whosoever will let him come in. And that's a strange covenant in religion. Religion wants to tell you, you got to be good enough, tall enough, rich enough, this enough, educated enough. Religion wants you to be the something that makes the merit to get you into a relationship with God. If you do enough penance, you'll be in relationship. If you give enough money, you'll be in relationship. If you speak enough tongues, you'll be in relationship. But God gave us a covenant of grace saying, you know what, even if you come short of those things, I still say come and the spirit says, come to God. Whosoever will is a covenant of grace. Are y'all with me on that part? And it is delivered to us by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to believe God. It is impossible to receive of God because they that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So I need you to, to separate, and I know this is more theology than you want this morning. I need you to separate this covenant of grace 
from the actions of faith. You are who you are in God because of the covenant of grace, God's unmerited favor to save the lost, but you receive that saving grace by exercising faith in God. You need to tell God over and over, I'm so glad that I'm saved. Yes, Father, I believe that Jesus died. He rose again. He was my justification and I received his righteousness. Why do we say that over and over? Because we remind ourselves, we rebuild our now faith. My last year's faith doesn't hold me in God today. I need now faith to stay in God because the stuff I'm dealing with now is tougher than I've ever dealt with in my life. I need some now faith to remind me that God didn't save me up until the pandemic came or up until the account went empty or up until sickness came or up until arthritis came. God saved me through these things, through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus, through it all. Somebody know what I'm saying. So I want your faith to stand in the promise of God, not in the practice of religion. Now, religion, pure and undefiled before God is to give and do those things and to not speak out of turn. We know we need that. In fact, I would say your religion is evidence of your faith. <laughs> your faith is not evidence of your religion. Your faith is what causes you to have pure religion undefiled. So think about the covenant of grace, God doing something for us, making us a promise that we accept by exercising faith toward God. When the company says you have no job and God said, I'm Jehovah Jireh, I'm your provider, who are you gonna believe? You gonna believe the company that you are broke and poor and naked and hungry? Or are you gonna believe God that said you have all things? All things are yours, things present, things to come. Ask what you will and I will do it. Circumstance gonna tell you it's terrible, God has told you it's wonderful. Who are you gonna believe? The covenant of grace is triggered by the heart of faith in the believer. We have to get up every day and believe God and tell God, I still believe you. The promise you made me 40 years ago, I still believe you. Abraham didn't stagger at the promise of God because it was so unheard of. He stood in that promise for decades and waited on God until he was too old to see the heir of promise naturally, and then he received the blessing of God. God has told some of the Lord's, I mean, the enemy has told some of the Lord's people that God's promises to you aren't going to happen now because A, B, C, D, A, and F. I'm here to disrupt and destroy that thought and tell you God is yet going to do it, and he's going to do it in a way that you will not be able to boast. Maybe if he did it while your cupboards were full, you would say, wow, look at all that I've, that I've done. Maybe you'd be Nebuchadnezzar and say, look at the kingdom that I have built. And if God does it when you have nothing, then you know that God did it unmistakably, undeniably God. And sometimes when God does it when you're weak, you get more strength because you say, well, Lord, I know that was you. That wasn't me at all. If he does what you couldn't even think to ask, you know it's God. Verse one, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I said this already. You prove that you are in God by producing evidence of things that aren't seen that become things that can be seen. I live right not because I'm trying to earn heaven. I live right because I'm already a citizen of heaven. I don't try and do good works to get enough of them done. I do get good works because the one good person, there is none good but God. Remember Jesus talking and they said, good master. He stopped and said, why do you call me good master? There is none good but God. He didn't deny that he was God. He wanted them to identify that the goodness they saw was the goodness of God. So if you have that goodness in you, if Christ lives in you of a truth, you're going to do good. You see, folks get caught up in trying to figure out if somebody's saved by their works. I'd rather figure out if you're saved by your faith. Show me your uh, salvation by your faith. Somebody looks at works and says, oh, they're such a good person. I don't know their heart. I don't know what they believe. They could be sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. But when I see the faith of Jesus Christ, then I know this is one of his. And he may still be perfecting them even while they're trying to hold on long enough to grow on to perfection. Amen. So now faith is a substance of things hoped for, spiritual things. I hope for heaven. And by faith, I know I have received it. I'm in the kingdom. I know it. I've been translated. I'm out of darkness. Old things have passed away. By the time the enemy gets you carnal enough, 
time is up. By the time the enemy gets you carnal enough to act on the lustful thoughts that have been in your heart for a long time, he's already damaged your faith. And don't spend your time trying to untangle the sin that has so easily beset you. Spend your time trying to rebuild the faith that gave you liberty in the first place. Remember in Galatians, when Paul went back and he said, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? You began in the spirit, now you're trying to walk in the flesh. The devil wants to get you so caught up on your hangups that you spent all your time on your hangups and it was faith that got you the blessing in the first place. When you come short of the glory of God, when you have sinned against God, rebuild that faith that got you blessed in the first place and that faith will get you blessed again. When you've lost all that you have, go back to God, get that relationship rebuilt and God will give you back what you had. If Job is an example, he'll give you more than you had. When Job's faith was tried, came through like pure gold, the end of the matter was better than the beginning. So when you find yourself disrupted and disrupt, go back and say, I know who I am. I'm a royal child. I'm a child of the most high God. I don't care what's happening to other folks. Devil, if you take my stuff, I go to my father and ask him for some most stuff. But Lord, please don't let me fall into the hands of it. David said, don't let me fall into the hands of man. David had sinned against God and went to his God as God's child and said, listen, it's me, it's David. I'm after your own heart. I still got faith. I still believe. I still trust you. Yeah, I messed up. But now don't let me fall into the hands of man. Let's get this thing over. God, whatever it takes to get the relationship right with you, that's what I want to do because then I'm going to flourish. Then I'm going to prosper. Then I'm going to be blessed. My fruit is going to come back and it will remain. If your joy is gone, your shout is gone, your peace is gone, my God, your faith is not. Use the tool that you have. Your faith got you the joy in the first place. Your faith got you the job in the first place. Your faith got you the husband, the house, and the yeah. wife, and the come child on, in the first place. Go back to God, get that faith right, and all of this stuff will be added. Somebody shout amen. Glory to God. Amen. So it's the evidence, it's the proof text of what I have believed being true. It's the proof text that somebody said to me the other day, you've had so many jobs. No, I haven't. Since I was 20 years old, I've had one job, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've had many supplements. I've gone and labored in many places to supplement the one job, when it looked like there isn't enough, I supplement with stuff, but make no mistake about it, what God has said is what's in me, amen, and what's in you. You may do other stuff to supplement. Paul made tents to supplement his ministry. He was no longer a tent maker. He was an apostle because that's what God labeled him. You may be in a situation that is temporary. Don't let that define who you are. I'm a royal child a peculiar nation. I'm zealous of good works. I identify everything as having come from God. So I thank God for all things. Let me, let me stop there. All right. So by faith, we understand by faith, the elders obtain a good testimony. We understand that the worlds that were framed were framed by the word of God. Listen to this. So that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. Your promise, your blessing, your prosperity, your anointing, your trust did not come from anything visible. The Galatians' mistake was they took faith, got full of the Holy Spirit, and then started thinking too much and overthought it and got themselves over into a place where they thought what they were doing was producing stuff rather than what they were believing producing stuff. I'd rather produce stuff with what I believe. You go out and tire yourself out producing it with what you do. Favor can get you a whole lot further than labor will ever get you. Labor is going to fail with the frailty of our human flesh. Faith will increase as the spirit, uh, as the flesh gets weak. Come on, somebody. As the spirit gets weak, our flesh in our faith increases. You bring the flesh into subjection by fasting. You weaken the flesh in relation to the spirit so that you now can do by lay by favor what you couldn't do by labor. It's why God says in the day of your fast, don't exact all of your labor. Why? Because you're going to strengthen the flesh in a time when you're claiming to be strengthening yourself in God. I'm strengthening myself in God, but I'm going to work so hard I don't recognize I'm hungry. Well, that's not the fast that the Lord have chosen. Oh, Jesus. When you're fasting for God, you're strengthening yourself. Read your Bible in places you've never read it. Read a commentary that you've never picked up. Don't go to work and say, can I have some overtime? I'm fasting and I can't eat anyway. <laughs> That's not evidence of faith. 
Now, you might need to do that until you can discipline yourself to fast on other days, don't get me wrong. But the true evidence of what's in you is what you produce, right? And part of it is because of a promise that God made and a covenant that was made before the foundation of the world. Some people talk about a, a covenant of redemption. Now, I don't really wanna go into that, but we do have a covenant where God has said, this is what I'm gonna do. You accept everything in this covenant, this agreement by faith. If you need a home, it's gonna to have to be by faith. Maybe you ain't gonna have a job. Maybe your business isn't gonna be there. Maybe the church ain't gonna pay you like it should. Maybe your talents aren't going to be rewarded. If you're a famous person, even famous folk don't always get the reward. Many a famous singer and athlete and folk like that that have made billions for others died without substance themselves. Faith is what turns that around and say many that have not labored get what others have labored for. God will store up the wealth of the wicked that you have not labored for, and he'll turn around and give you something that you ain't put not one sweaty brow to. You ain't labored one minute, God gave it to you. That's a covenant of grace. No, I didn't deserve everything that I have. How in the world do we deserve a church like this? But God gave it to us. Other people built it. People built this church that are not in this church today. And yet God gave it to us. And we had the testimony of the woman that was there that said, we've been holding this church and we don't even know for whom we're holding it. Mother Bowers walked in the door. I saw the woman start crying. She told us to leave. We came back later and said, what was that about? She said, I've been waiting. And when you all walked in the door, the Holy Spirit told me, this is who he's been telling me that the church belonged to. That was before we ever filled out an application, talked about anything. That was upon meeting her, the Holy Ghost said, that's them. So we can't even say that we worked hard and got this church. All we can say is we believe God and received it. Somebody sung it. Believe and receive it. <laughs> God will perform it today. I'm just about done. I wanted to get much more in there, but if I cause you to rethink your faith from being something that grabs stuff to something that produces stuff, then I think we're there. If I've got you to understand that we don't have a covenant of works, we have a covenant of grace, then I think, uh, then I think you've gotten there. And one of the things when you talk about the, uh, the, the hermeneutics, why we believe what we believe, uh, if you go back, there's a concept of total depravity of man. It's part of the, the, the it's actually Calvinist, so I don't want to get too far in it, but, but one of those things is they believe that man is so totally depraved that we couldn't do anything, even if we wanted to, it wouldn't be acceptable to God. In other words, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. To get from that to all things belong to us, we have to have faith that God is willing to do all of the stuff. Once I accept the fact that all the righteousness I produce is unacceptable to God, I start seeking another righteousness that is pure and undefiled and acceptable for God. And the only place I find that righteousness is in Jesus Christ. So I'm secure now, not because of me, but because of Christ. Can somebody wave at me if you got that? Abraham said this, I mean, the Bible said this about Abraham in the fourth chapter of Romans in verse 16. It says, it was talking about the law. So let me go back just a little bit. For the promise that he, that's Abraham, would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law. So it wasn't a mosaic lineage of the law. It was to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. We get what Abraham was promised when we live the faith that Jesus Christ brought to us. Is anybody there? We get what the promise of Abraham was when we live the faith that Jesus Christ delivered to us. The seed of Abraham is the seed of the woman, is the seed of the son of man, Jesus Christ. So when we accept Jesus, we skip Moses, we skip the law, we go back to Abraham. Abraham lived by faith and God wanted to make sure that everybody got the promise that Abraham had. What was the promise that Abraham had? Look at the verse 16, it tells us, or 13. The promise that he would be heir of a few things. Somebody out there say heir of the world. God didn't promise Abraham just the land that he stepped on over there in, in, in Israel. He promised Abraham that he would be the heir of the world, that Abraham would deliver such a seed of promise that the whole world would be blessed. So the world that belongs to God 
the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof was promised to us through Abraham. We're looking at worldly folks holding on to stuff saying, oh, I wish I were blessed like them. Well, that's your stuff. <laughs> the promise was not to Beelzebub. The promise was to, a to, to Adam, to Abraham, to Jesus, to you. The promise of all things are yours was never made to Lucifer. God never told Lucifer all things are yours, things that are present, things to come, the world to come. He told you all things are yours. Now, the mechanism to receive that grace covenant promise is faith. Abraham proved to us how to get this thing done, and he did it 430 years before the law. So those of you that think you're going to do it by labor and by doctrine and dogma, you're not. You're going to do it by faith because that's how your father Abraham did it. Your faith is more important to you than your labor ever will be. Four verses, and I'm going to finish this. The promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law but through the righteousness of faith. Faith produces righteousness. For if those who are of the law are heirs, if they're going to get everything, then faith is useless and void, and the promise is ineffectual. Verse 15, chapter 4 of Romans. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, covenant of grace, delivered by faith, so that the promise might be sure to all of the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but those also in the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all. Both covenants, the law and grace, Abraham's over both of them. Isn't that all right? You get your promise because of this verse, not all of the ones, the Deuteronomy, the, 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 the Pentateuch and all of that. You get your promise right here in Abraham that he's the heir of the world and I'm the heir of him. I get what Abraham had through Jesus Christ. Somebody wave your hand at me. God wanted to make sure, look at the verse, that the promise might be sure. Verse 16, chapter 4, Romans. God, therefore, it is of faith. Why? That it might be according to grace. Faith delivering the grace covenant so that the promise might be sure to get to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but to those that are of the faith of Abraham. Now, I said before that one of the tenets of the, um, the, the classical Augustine and, and Calvin doctrine is total depravity. Uh, unconditional security, and then they get to one that's called uh, limited atonement. That's where I part with them. I don't believe that the atonement is limited to the elect. I believe that the atonement that Jesus made allows anybody to hook up with Abraham. Anybody can come into this covenant. Anybody can walk in. So I don't believe there's a limited atonement. I believe Jesus died for everybody. And anybody that will exercise faith can not only get salvation, but they can get blessed with Father Abraham. Abraham was not hungry. Abraham was not poor. Abraham was not broke. Abraham was so prolific that he had children in his old age. His seed became like the sands of the earth. You are hooked into that promise right there in this verse that this promise might be sure to get to you the one thing you have to guard is your faith we're in a time where the devil wants you to forget what you once believed he wants you to give up what you started with the song used to say do you have what you started with get that faith that caused you to be blessed and you'll be blessed again i'm going to finish in verse 17. therefore it is a faith that it might be according to grace this promise from God might be sure to get to you and to your children, your children's children. I'm adding that in. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham, that's us, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. He believed God. We believe God. We're tied back in. Who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Close the Bible, I'm done. Put a fork in it, it's over. Listen, you need to stand here and call things that are not as though they were. Amen? I got stuff, I got bills piled up. Your church got bills, we got bills. I'm calling things that are not, I'm calling stuff paid. When I say, Lord, I set my debts before you, I expect them to be paid. And so many of them have been. I was talking the other day, Mother Bowers had an envelope for a specific thing under this altar for years. It came to pass. God did it. Now, she had to get some lawyers to make it do it, but God did it. There are things under this altar that are going to come to pass in spite of what I'm looking at outside of here. Somebody say, well, Pastor, you too old to do this. No, I'm not. Mother Bowers said the other day, in my spirit, I am no older today than I was 
when the Lord brought me into this life. Isn't that amazing? If I ain't get nothing else out of that message, that's, that hit me like a ton of bricks. Cause I've been saying, oh my God, 63, what am I gonna do? Let me lay down somewhere and rest. No, listen, if I'm the same called elder that I was when he called me, flesh has to get subject to my flesh, flesh gets subject to my spirit. My faith is woke up now because I've been letting the flesh tell me what I can and cannot do. I now say like Paul, I bring the flesh under subjection. If my flesh can't do it, Lord, send me some young person that I can instruct how to do it. Isn't that right? I can give them the wisdom that I've learned and say, run on, son, do what I cannot do. David gave to Solomon an anointing to build a temple that David could not build. God don't stop because we get a little tired. <laughs> Lead us alone. By faith, God's going to do everything he said he was going to do. God bless you. Thank you for your time and your patience. I looked up at the clock. I don't know where the time went, but I hope it's been helpful to you. Work on your faith. Quit worrying about your stuff, your things, this and that. Work on your faith. That same faith that produced all of your blessings before will produce them again, over and over and over again. Just remember, when you get confused, go back to Romans 4, 16. God said, this promise is sure to get to everybody. If I had to worry about what sins folks are hiding in their faith to determine whether or not they're Christian, you can't see iniquity. I don't know who's sitting in the congregation filled with iniquity. So I'd rather judge the faith of what they believe. I can tell what you believe by what you testify. You overcome by the blood of the lamb. I know what the blood is and the word of your testimony. When you start testifying about Jesus, I can feel whether or not you believe that because you're going to act like folks act when you have faith. I'm illuminated because I got faith. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you for this. Hope this word has been good to you. Father, settle your word in our hearts and minds. Let it be a lamp unto our feet. Let it be yea and amen and all that hear it. Let the hearer be blessed and the hearer become the speaker. Let the student be the teacher carrying on and giving this word to others that will teach them others also. You said in your word that the young servant should be one that would teach men that would teach others also. Let it be so. Let us be men and women that will hear, receive, and freely give this gospel of peace in 